Good morning, friends. Let's try that again. Good morning, friends. Good morning. I'm some people are like, I don't even know you guys. How am I your friend? Um, if you're new here, we're happy to have you. Um, really, we, 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 we like to say that in City Church that even though our Christian work is personal, it is not private. And so one of the implications of that is we gather together on Sundays like this. But another implication is that we do life together in small groups. And so I want to encourage those who, of you who are new here and you've decided to make this your home, please don't just make it a Sunday thing. We'd like to see more of you. We'd like to get to know you a little bit more. Um, we have been in this series in the book of Mark, just meditating on the person of Jesus. And we've called it Understanding the Son of of God, understanding the Son of God. And we called you that because really the entire thing that holds the book of Mark together is the person of Jesus Christ and really his identity as the Son of God, this King that rules everything and superintends everything. Um, and so, you know, like a very good series, you may have missed, actually, you've missed a lot. <laughs> this is the ninth sermon. But often in good series, you can still watch one episode and still get a hang of what this show is about. And so we're hoping that even though you may have come, you know, um, maybe a little bit, you know, halfway in between, that you still get something today. I pray that that's the case in Jesus' name. Um, so I don't know if you've ever had a case of mistaken identity in, in your life. Or maybe you've watched a movie where that was the case. Um, I remember a holy... I don't know why I said, I said Hollywood in first service as well. I remember a Nollywood movie I watched, um, and it was the case that there was a lady and a guy who were, it was, it was a morning um, work day, they were rushing to work, and they were both you know, at a fuel station, and they tried to fill up their tank so that they could go about the normal course of their day. And so the guy was in front, the lady was at the back, and the guy was trying to buy petrol to fill up his car, but he was taking time. And this lady was, you know, blaring her horn, asking him to be quick because she had this very important meeting that she needed to get to. It should be fast, it should be fast. You know, a little altercation, you know, between them. They exchanged words. She was rude to him. He eventually bought his fuel and he drove off. She bought her petrol and she drove off. And so she gets to work and she's hurrying. Um, because her boss is standing there. This presentation, these people are already around, blah, blah, blah. Let's get this presentation going. And so she packs her file to go and make the presentation. She steps into the boardroom, and who does she see there? The guy from the petrol station. And she was going to enter the ground, right? And so, you know, stuff like that happens in movies. But it's not just movies. It's also real life. Um, and so I think one of the, some of you may have seen this video, one of the most famous ones is from 2006. Is that from me? No, it's not. Um, from 2006, May 2006. So the background, because we'll watch a video now, the background is that there had been a, a series of cases of litigation between Apple computers, what is now known as Apple Incorporated, who are the makers of your iPhone, the best phone in the world. Um, this is not a paid advert, but I'm just saying, you have to be on the... On the, on the right side of history. Um, your iPad and all of those things. Um, your MacBook. Um, you s guys, seriously. You know. So that's Apple Computers at the time, now Apple Incorporated, and Apple Core. Apple Core was a, an entertainment company that was made up of different parts, but really what they, they held the rights to um, the records of the Beatles, one of the greatest bands ever. Um, rock bands ever. And so they held the rights to um, the, the Beatles catalog and all of those things. And so the litigation was about Apple versus Apple, who has the right to use Apple. Both of them were using the Apple logo and all of those other kinds of things. Um, so in 2006, Apple computers had just launched the um, iTunes store, which was a digital market that was going to now be making you know, um, records available over the internet. And so the Apple Core, the other one, they were suing on the basis of that. Now, eventually, litigation ends. The high court in England rules in favor of Apple computers that they can do that. It's not a violation of the terms of agreement that they had before. And so, like, you know, typical um, news stations do, the BBC asked for a... Um, 
tech expert to come and give his opinion on that case and what the implications were for the general public. And so they asked for a guy named Guy Cuny to come. And so Guy Cuny comes, they put him in um, a reception area in the BBC building in London, and he's waiting to go for this interview on live TV. But there's another guy named Guy, Guy Goma, who on that very day, he's also having an interview for a job position in the BBC. And he's also in another reception in that same building, waiting to be called for his own interview. And so um, the producer of the show comes, rushes down into the reception area, and he shouts, Guy. And our guy, Guy, <laughs> Guy Goma, <laughs> hears Guy, and he stands up, I'm Guy. And so the man, he follows the producer up, goes up, and then he gets up, he sees all these cameras. And like, I came for a job interview, I don't know, but maybe, maybe this is what the job interview is about. And so he, he enters in, somebody starts doing his makeup for him, like, no, 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 I, like, why do I need this for my job interview? But it's like, anyhow, maybe this is part of the whole stuff. And then they usher him somewhere to wait and sit down. And this is what happens. <laughs> for the industry and the growth of music online. Well, Guy Cuny is the editor of the technology website uh, News Wireless. Hello, good morning to you. Good morning. Were you surprised by this uh, verdict today? I'm very surprised to see this verdict to, to come on me because I was not expecting that. When I came, uh, they told me something else and I'm coming. You, you got an interview there, so it's a big surprise anyway. A big surprise. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah. Um, with regards to uh, the cost that's in, in, involved, um, do you think uh, now more people will be downloading online? Uh, actually, if you can go everywhere, you're going you're gonna to see a lot of people downloading uh, to the internet uh, and the website, uh, everything they want. But I think uh, it's, it's much better for the development and uh, to improve people what uh, they want and to get uh, on the easy way and so fast uh, the things they're looking for. This does really seem to be the way the music industry is progressing now, that people want to go onto the website and download music. Exactly. You can go everywhere on the cyber cafe and you can check. You can go easy. It's going to be a very easy way for everyone to get something to the internet. Thank you, Nee. Thanks very much indeed. I think we can now also speak to... Uh First thing to note is that when this guy wrote in his CV, I can walk under pressure. <laughs> it was not a lie. <laughs> it was not a lie. You can see the guy breathing, heaving. And the interesting thing was that he still answered the questions. Now, um, recently I watched, so this was 2006, so it's almost 20 years ago. Last year, he was, he was asked on another TV <laughs> on another TV show, rightly this time, and then they asked him what he was up to. Um, and what he will be doing. And so he said he's, going, he's working on a book and he's going to title it The Wrong Guy. I was like, oh, this guy, this guy is good. Guy is a good guy, you know. But what are the dynamics of that moment? It was when, obviously, he tells them after that I'm not guy because he's, he's come for a job. He's a Congolese French person who's just moved to the, possibly just moved to the UK, tried to get a job. And so, what led to this confusion about identity? What actually happened was the producer comes down, was later found that the producer came down from, you know, from the studio to the reception area to ask for Guy, and then the receptionist says, pointing to this guy, that's Guy. And the producer says, no, but this is the picture I have. He's a white person. The receptionist says, no, 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 this is Guy. Because the producer had five minutes before the live show, he didn't bother trying to interrogate to find out. He calls this guy, and he ends up being the wrong guy. What happened? Because of haste, 
because of hurry, he missed out on who the real guy was. And in many ways, that's what our text is this morning. That there are people, you and I in this room, that for several reasons, we can miss out on who Jesus is. We can miss out on what God has for us. For some of us, he's hate. For some of us, he's hurry. But that all of us are constantly in danger of missing God. If there's anything God likes to do is to reveal himself, is to present himself to us in the ordinariness of life. Sometimes with spectacular things, as we're gathered in a Sunday service like this, somebody has a prophetic word, but oftentimes God likes to com commend himself to us low-key. And if we're not careful, we can miss God. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 16, we're told of the story of Jacob, who He's running through life, and he gets to a place, and he sleeps. And when he sleeps, he has a revelation, and on waking up, this is what he says. He says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. I pray that won't be your story in Jesus' name. I pray that you won't miss God. I pray that God will alert and heighten your sensitivity of him so that you can always see him through your day, and through your life in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've called this sermon, How We Miss God. How We Miss God. And we're going to be considering what this passage of Scripture has to say to us. I should warn you, um, maybe not warn, maybe that's a little bit too extra. It's a little bit, today's sermon is a little bit on the teaching end, less on the preaching end. And so that means you might not have as many points of, woo, wow. Somebody's like, did we used to say that to you before, Emmanuel? Calm down. But it might, it might not be as exciting, but hopefully by God's grace, it's going to be um, um, powerful for you as well. And so I want you to wear your th thinking caps. I want you to let us think together. And so if you have missed out on where we've been so far, where we've been so far, Tommy showed us a couple of weeks ago, we've seen Jesus work an astounding miracle. Um, there was... There were 5,000 men and lots of women and children who were with him, and Jesus fed them with five loaves of bread and two fish. So that was a great miracle. And to make sure that you know that God is not just a God who does just the bare minimum, there were 12 baskets left over. There was a lot of abundance, and God provided not just for the people who ate, but the people who served. And just feel like saying that, that some of you are here, you've been serving God, and you're wondering, God, where's my basket? God's basket is for you. There's something God has in store for you, and it's just around the corner. And so just keep waiting on God, keep serving, and keep trusting God. And so Tommy showed us that it wasn't just the abundance, but it was Jesus providing for those 12. And after that, Jesus then sends his disciples, the 12, to go to the other side of the lake, but somehow they get stuck on the water. Jesus sends them to Gennesaret. They end up in Bethsaida. But in that moment, Jesus reveals himself to them as the Son of God. He walks on the water. He, even though they've missed their course and missed their destination, Jesus still manifests himself to them. And so from all that we know, Jesus is still in that place in Bethsaida. Jesus is still um, doing his ministry, carrying out his ministry at that point. And so we're told in verse 1, this is really the background to verse 1, that there were some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord, the religious leaders who had heard about Jesus, heard about all the things that Jesus had done, and then they decided to come all the way from Jerusalem to where Jesus was. That was a journey of about 70 miles, which in our Lagosian palace is like traveling from here to Ibadan, about 100, more than 100 kilometers journey. And so that tells us that this wasn't just a casual visit. In fact, you might miss it here in the NIV. But in the NLT, it says that they actually went to see Jesus. There was an intentionality with this trip. And so you think that maybe, you know, they have this dossier of questions that they were going to ask Jesus, this list of things. Hey, Jesus, what does this passage mean? Jesus, what do you think about this? Jesus, why do you do this? You think that they have all these questions that they're going to present to Jesus. But actually, verse 2 tells us that they end up seeing Jesus, but they don't see Jesus. They end up having a meeting with Jesus but they don't see Jesus. Instead, what they see are the disciples of Jesus. They see them eating. That is weird. This is like having a meeting with President Tinubu. You, 
gone through all the wahala of contacting the um, chief of staff and all the secretaries, the um, secretary of the federal government and all of those kind of things, and you finally land in an appointment. And when you are in the presence of President Tinubu, all you can see is his ADC, his assistant, who is acting weird. If you are smart, if you are wise, you're like, no, I, this meeting is so important, I won't allow it to distract me. But instead, what happens is that they are sidetracked by what the disciples are doing. And can I just say to you, brothers and sisters, this morning, that we are also in the same danger of meeting God and yet missing him. In this passage, we see that the Pharisees are the people who were religious, people who knew the scriptures. In fact, part of the requirement for being a Pharisee was that you had to be well-versed in the Torah, which was the Old Testament. And so you had to know it. Sometimes they would even memorize it. And so you, these, was, these were people that were steeped in scriptures. They were the people that knew God. They were the professionals. And yet, God in the flesh is before them, and somehow they miss him. And can I say that that same danger exists for us this morning? Those of us who are very cerebral, those of us who are very, you know, passionate, those of us who are very prophetic, you are, ah, no, the presence of God, the atmosphere of God, the atmosphere of his presence, and all of these things, and yet we can be in touch with God and yet not touch God. But what specifically do the Pharisees see about the disciples? Verse 2 tells us that they saw them eating with hands that were unwashed. And so those of us who are modern people, you think, ah, okay, this is probably like a health thing, right? Like they should have washed their hands because as you go out, you carry germs and all of those things. But actually the passage shows us that it's a little bit more than that. It's hands that were defiled. I will get a little bit more into, you know, what that means, but I just want us to double-click, as it were, on this verse 2. That the reason why the Pharisees miss Jesus, miss God's person standing right in front of them is because they were distracted by other people. And can I just say that, friends, that that can happen to you and I as well. There's a parable Jesus tells in Luke chapter 18 of two people who come into the presence of God, who, like you and I, have driven from different parts of the city of Lagos, from Aja, from, I was going to say Korodu, Ikorodu, I don't know if there's any Korodu person here, from mainland, from all the different places that we've come from. And now these two people are standing in the presence of God, and one of them is a tax collector. And because he's so aware of the presence of God, he sees himself as he truly is, and he says, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. But then this other person who is a spiritual person is more aware of this tax collector standing beside him and not aware of God, and all he can do is compare himself to this person. And he begins to pray and say, God, I thank you. I am not like this person. In fact, when we read the passage very carefully, you see that the words I, I, I keep recurring there. He's in the presence of God, and yet he misses out on God. The question I have for you, friends, this morning is, who is that person that is distracting you from God? Maybe some of us, as we step into church on Sundays, and we have come for a time of worship, we are more conscious of the people on stage and what they are singing and doing and wearing than we are of God. Maybe we are like the Pharisee, like there's somebody right beside you. Maybe the person is smelling of kaika and you're like, I am so sure this one just walked in from the club. I thank God I am not like this person. But don't you see, the church is not a museum for perfect people. It's a hospital for those who are recovering. And every time we are comparing ourselves with people, we miss out on God. But it's not just people that distract us. We can sometimes be distracted by things. And that's what we see with Jacob that I referred to earlier in Genesis chapter 28 verse 16. Jacob was really 
interested and obsessed with doing all the things he had on his list. He had this long journey that he had to make. He was running for his life from his elder brother, from, not his elder brother, his twin brother, um, Esau. And he was trying to get away to his uncle's house, his uncle Laban. And he was so concerned about that, that he goes to sleep and he misses out on God's presence. And some of us can be so concerned about all the different things that we need to get done in our day. I need to have this meeting. I need to look at this person. I need to send this email. I need to get this report done. I have all this list of things to do. I don't really have time for God. But is it true, though? I'm yet to meet that person who is so busy that they didn't have time to send a text to their spouse, check on their children, or maybe like some of us do, spend five minutes scrolling through Insta blog and whatever just to find out what the latest news is. Actually, the reason why we miss out on God is not because we are so busy. It is because we are distracted by other things. We miss God's person like the Pharisees when we are distracted by people and we're distracted by things. And so what should we do instead? One practice I can commend to you is the prayer of the psalmist in Psalm 86, verse 10 to 11. It's a good prayer to pray. It says, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. And so the psalmist is gazing upon God. He's meditating on the reality of God. And in light of that, he says in verse 11, he says, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. In other translations, he says, unite my heart. In other words, our hearts are so fractured that we need the grace of God to constantly have our heart together so that we can have our focus on him. A great prayer to pray as you step through your day, as you're about to read your Bible, as you're about to do all the things you, you, you need to do. Say, God, unite my heart to fear your name. Bind my heart together as with fetters so that it can be focused on you. And so I like the words of that hymn that some of us know very well. It says, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing your praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of silent praise. And then it says at the end, oh to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to be. Let your goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. My heart wanders, oh God, let your grace bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Ask God to unite your heart to fear his name. For some of us, what that might mean is to ask God to remind us of what he has saved us from so that we can constantly be marveling at his grace towards us. Some of you know where you were the night Jesus rescued you. Some of you know the things that you had your hands in. And that same grace that was extended to you in the past is still that same grace that is at work in you in the present. And it's that same grace that carries you all the way to the end. If you had a heart sickness and you needed a heart transplant and you had looked left and right, north and south, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, you had looked everywhere and there was no chance. You had gone to the hospital and they say you are down at the bottom of the waiting list. And as you have given up hope and then somebody calls you and says, I'm going to give you my heart. Let me tell you what will never happen. You will never forget that person because you realize with every beat of your heart that I'm alive because somebody else gave me their heart. With every pumping of your vein, I'm alive because somebody else gave me their heart. That is what God has done for us in Jesus. You must never miss God's person. But it's not just us Christians who are in this room. Maybe some of you would describe yourself as not a Christian. You are not somebody who is close to God. You are not somebody who names the name of Jesus. And for some of, that, for some of us, part of the reason why that is the case is because 
I'm like, I know this very bad person who describes themselves as a Christian. Certainly, Christianity cannot be true. Or maybe some of us will say, I was part of a very bad church where I was hurt. Certainly, Christianity cannot be true. And maybe those things you described are true. In fact, in most cases, they often are. And it's sad. And it's a travesty. But don't you see, friends, that we don't engage, we don't determine the truth of a thing by what other people say about it only. We also determine the truth of a thing by what that thing says about itself. You can watch videos of jollof rice made in Nigeria and Senegal and Ghana. And you can have people describe it to you, but the only way you truly appreciate the majesty of Nigerian jollof is to taste it. And so Psalm 34 verse 8 says this. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. The only way you can know that the word of God is true, the only way that you can know that the person of Jesus is glorious is by tasting. And so I'm asking you this morning, if you are not a Christian, if you are somebody who has walked away from Jesus, don't miss out on God because of other people. Jesus is waiting eagerly. He's extending his arms to you and inviting you to come to him. But that's not the only thing the Pharisees miss out on. They don't just miss out on God's person because they are distracted by other people and other things. They miss out on something else. We see, like I said earlier in verses 1 and 2, that they were they were worried about the disciples who were eating with hands unwashed because these hands were defiled. And verse 3 and 4 helps us understand this a little bit more. It says that this hand washing thing was a practice of the Jews. And it wasn't just a practice of the Jews. It was that the Pharisees had taken it up a notch, like several notches, in fact. They had taken it high and high, and it was something that was held in high regard. And so when they go out and they're about to eat, they wash their hands. When they have gone to the marketplace, they come back and they wash. And commentators tell us that when it talks about washing, there is not just like you wash your hand. It is that you go inside the pool and you immerse yourself so that you can be cleansed from all the impurities on the outside before you then go out to eat your food. They wash their pots, they wash their pans, they wash all the washables, they wash their ceiling. I'm sure those guys washed everything. So to you and I, that can seem like a little bit of OCD. Like, I won't say it. I wanted to go there. I won't go there. I won't go there. I won't go there. Lord, help me. But like a little bit of OCD, why? Why this obsession? And so there's a little bit of theological background. Okay, and this is where I need you to be awake. If your eyes are closing, do like this, you know. Um, wear your thinking caps if you haven't got any. And this is good for you. This is good for me. This is God's word. This is good theology. And so the theological background is that some of you might know this, that when the children of Israel, who would later become the Jewish nation, the, the people of God, they were in captivity for several years. And eventually God rescues them and he gives them something called the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. But before he does that in Exodus chapter 20, he gives them, he says certain things to them and he gives them some instructions. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, specifically verse 6, he says, he describes them as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so God says he wants to have a dialogue with them because the import of that reality is that if you're a kingdom of priests, you're a holy nation, you are set apart to God. And so God says, I'm going to have a dialogue with you. I'm going to have a family meeting. Okay, so I want to meet with the nation of Israel. You guys come and meet with me. And one of the requirements God gives them in verse 10 is that they are meant to wash their clothes. And verse 14 tells us that they actually obey God. They wash their clothes because it was a sign of consecration, of devotion to God. In fact, one of the things it says, if there's anybody who doesn't obey this, they're going to be cut off, they're going to be um, um, put to death because they have desecrated God's holiness and God's presence. And so they were supposed to present themselves as these holy people as they come to meet with God. But then God doesn't stop there. 
God says that from this kingdom of priests, these people that have been set apart, I'm going to appoint another group that are going to be actual priests. That's going to be their nine to five. That's going to be their daily job. They're going to be representing this kingdom of priests before me. So you can think of them as priests times two. They're a little bit on the higher pedestal than these other people. They are representing God to the people and the people to God. And one of the things God says when he's inaugurating them in in verse 4 of chapter 29 is that these people are meant to wash with water before they meet him. Do you see there's a lot of washing going on here? But this wasn't just a one-time thing. In chapter 30, God says part of the things that they are meant to do when they come before him is also to wash. And so let's read Verses 17 to 21 of chapter 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. So you see what's going on here. God is saying, I am so holy, I am so righteous, I am so set apart, and you are a defiled people that actually you have to have these priests who are constantly approaching me on your behalf, but those priests have to always be cleansing themselves as a reminder of the fact that I am a holy God and you are a defiled people, and so they have to come into my presence properly. And so this entire washing thing was a reminder of the need, um, of, of the reality of sin And how much we need God's cleansing to be able to come before his presence. So that's what's going on here. But what has it become about? For the Pharisees, this thing that was meant to be a reminder of the holiness of God and how we can approach his presence became about what to eat, how to eat, what not to eat. It's like a case of Chinese whispers. If you've ever played that game, What basically goes on is that you gather a group of about 20 people, you whisper something in the ears of the first person, and then you say, you can only say it once, and whisper it to the next person, who said it to the next person, who said it to the next person, and then you come back and say it to me. And what often happens is that at the beginning of the game, you say something like, Ade is a fine boy. And then it goes around, it goes around, it goes around, and then it becomes something like, Pade Minisale. And you're like, "How, how, how, how how did this even happen? What is going on here? God gives instruction reminding the people of his holiness and how to approach him. And it has become about washing hands and what to eat and when not to eat. Essentially, for the Pharisees, it became a thing of, you are one of us. You are not one of us. It became a line of demarcation for this extra special group. And the truth is that before we knock the Pharisees as being overzealous people, I think there was a legitimate concern there. The legitimate concern is if we are this holy nation that has been set apart for God's purposes, then it means we have to be careful about being defiled by the world. And maybe some of us are here like that. You're like, ah, man, Christians, like we need to be really careful, though. Sin is real, oh, the devil is real, oh, he's doing all these things, so let's not do all these things. Let's mark ourselves as different from the world so that people can actually see us as these holy people. But essentially what you are doing is that you are twisting God's word. And by twisting God's word, missing out on God. And so I like what this person says, Roy Pearson. He says, it is a fact too long neglected that the church has in common with the chimney sweep that it cannot do its job in comfortable surroundings or with clean hands. In this sense, cleanliness is not next to godliness. Death is. Death, pain, sorrow, prejudice, injustice, and treachery. What's he saying? 
Yes, we are people who are called out by God, but we are not called out by God to live in isolation so that we can tell everybody else how bad they are. We are called as a testimony to the saving grace of God and how he can make people like you and I set apart and holy unto him. That's what this is all about. But the Pharisees have twisted it to make it something else. But I think we also are in danger of twisting God's word in our day. And as I reflected on this passage and I reflect on our own times, I think that there are about five ways that we do this. And so I'm just going to walk us through this part. So one way we twist the word of God is by what I call expansion. Can we say that together? Expansion. And so out of a zeal for God's word, we expand it to bind other people who don't need to be bound. And so that's what the, the, the Pharisees have done here in verse 5 by insisting that the disciples need to wash their hands before they eat. What they've done is they've expanded the word of God. I don't know if you caught it when I was talking about Exodus and all the things that was going on there. You see, in Exodus, the only people who were supposed to perpetually always wash themselves were who? The priests. It was not a command for all of God's people, but somehow the, the Pharisees have so expanded this instruction from the word of God and they have bound other people's conscience by it when actually God didn't say other people should. Maybe some of us are also doing that. We expand the word of God because we are so concerned that, ah, if we say that, you know, you, can, you don't have to do this, people are going to run in a different direction. But actually what you have done is that you've elevated your own instruction and diselevated, if there's anything like that, God's word. Expansion. Another one is Substitution. Substitution. And so here, for selfish gain, we make two or more of God's commands compete with each other, and then we choose the one that we prefer. Did you see that in the passage that we read? In verses 9 to 13, what happened? The Pharisees, Jesus in rebuking the Pharisees, talks about the fact that they were twisting God's word, and then he gives an example. He says, the word of God says... That you should honor your father and your mother. That's what the, one of the, the commands in the Ten Commandments says. And then it says to show that that is a very serious thing. The word of God also says anybody who doesn't honor their father and their mother is like somebody who has cursed their father or their mother. And that person is to be put to death. So this is a very serious thing. But what have the Pharisees done? They say, ah, and this thing is true. But actually... The word of God allows us to be able to give generous gifts to people. And so, when to, to God, sorry, you give generous gifts to God. That generous gift to God is something that is called the korban. And so, you can, you can give a generous gift to God. But if you have given a generous gift to God, why do you need to give to your parents? You don't need to give to your parents. You can just give to God, do this one command, and forget about this other thing. They have made a false dichotomy between those two commands. Instead of saying, the word of God says this, the word of God says this, find the way of doing both. They say, oh, no, because this one actually benefits us. When you give to God, it's obviously coming to us. So just focus on this one and forget about this other one. Do you see? And we do that today as well. When people say stuff like, ah, uh, the word of God commands us to give generously to the house of God. We should tithe. We should give of our, of, our, of our income of a certain percentage regularly to the house of God to see the work of God continue to advance. But ah, the word of God also says that we should give to the poor. And all these churches say, I don't even know what they are really doing with this money. So I think I'll give to the poor and forget about this one. What have you done? You have substituted you have made two of God's commands compete with each other when there was no need for them to compete with each other. And you have chosen the one that you prefer. Because that other one, you can do it when you like. You can give of any portion that you like. It doesn't really matter. Substitution. Another one that we do is modification. Or you can call this modernization. Modification. Modification. And so for selfish reasons, we rationalize God's word and we think of how we can make it suit our own preferences. So for instance, 
Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, The marriage bed is to be held in honor by all. Marriage should be honored by all. The marriage bed is to be kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. And so you say, ah, that is very, very true. God will judge all those in marriage who are committing adultery. So married people don't commit adultery. God will judge all the single people who are not in marriage relationships, who are sleeping with each other. So single people don't do that. But you see those of us that are dating. Because really, what is dating? Dating is that you are considering what? Marriage. And if you've dated for two years, three years, in fact, I've met her parents, we are technically what? Married. <laughs> There's nothing like technical marriage, friends. <laughs> Just so we are clear. The word of God is the word of God. We don't modernize it. We don't modify it to fit what we want. We simply obey it as inconvenient as it may be sometimes. So sometimes we expand, we substitute, we modify. Another one that I think we do very well is we add to the word of God. So what's this one? Addition is simply out of a zeal to ensure compliance. We add to God's word so that people can obey it. And I think, really, those of us who are into, people do it in different ways, but I think those of us who are more into the prophetic are the people who are most likely to do this. What do I mean? God said, God told me. And then you take this thing that you have received, whether as a personal conviction or as a personal revelation from God, and you say that this applies to everybody, all Christians. What you have simply done is you've added to the word of God. I remember when I was in law school, there was this gentleman who was a fireful brother, and then, you know, he had been, obviously, give your life to Christ. If you give your life to Christ, you people, and it wasn't, it wasn't happening. And so... A few weeks before our bar finals, because bar finals, if you've heard from any law student or lawyer, they are crazy, they're insane. People are fainting at the exam hall, like it's, it's, it's madness. And so everybody loves God at that point. Everybody wants something from God. Everybody is consecrated to God. And so this gentleman, we're having a prayer meeting, and this gentleman stands up and he starts, he starts telling people to give their life to Christ. If you are wearing trousers, you're not covering your hair, you are going to hell. People stopped wearing trousers. <laughs> who wants to go to hell? Like, who wants to go to hell? But the problem, though, and, you know, a few people had a conversation with him. The problem was that he had done what? Added to the word of God. There was nothing like that. Nothing. Absolutely. That says that the condition for going to hellfire is by wearing trousers and uncovering your hair. Nothing like that. But he was trying to urge people to the way of righteousness, and he ended up adding to the word of God. Another one, I think this one is by far the most common now, is subtraction. And so to accommodate our desires, we remove from God's word so that we can do what we want. We take away from God's word so that we can do what we want. And so you have someone who says, ah, I don't like what Paul says about women. And by the way, he's even the one that says this couple of things about sex and all that. I don't like what he says as well. Um, I don't like this whole thing about people trusting in Jesus as the only way to salvation. So you end up removing all the parts you don't like. You end up deleting. Then you start calling into question, when was the Bible even written? Self? How are we sure that what we had then is what we have now? And then you start asking all these questions. And then you remove all the parts that you don't like. I always wonder, people don't question, love your neighbor as yourself. Nobody questions that one. People always question the ethical stuff. But anyhow, let's leave that. You remove all of those things. And then what you have left is the part that you agree with. And then you say, ah, this is the part I like. This is the word of God. This is what I'm going to do. What you have simply done is you thought that you were finding out the real word of God. What you have done is that you have, you have ended up with your own words. You have so removed the word of God. You have so adjusted it to suit your own preferences and ideas that you have ended up twisting the word of God. And so the question I have for you, friends, this morning, 
How are you twisting the word of God? Are you expanding? Are you substituting? Are you modifying? Are you adding? Or are you subtracting? Because the truth, friends, is that when we do this like the Pharisees, we adjust the word of God to accommodate something that we desire, we end up missing God. So how should we respond to God's word instead? I think Jesus gives us a right way to do it. And you see that in verse 6. When Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he's rebuking them, he says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, hypocrites, as it is written. And then he goes on to quote from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. And if you are somebody who is familiar with the Bible, you're like, eh, Jesus, that's, that's gymnastics. That, you've just done what Emmanuel said we shouldn't do. Because the Pharisees were not alive when Isaiah was writing. Jesus, you have committed blunder. Except Jesus hasn't. Jesus has done something called obedient, what I call obedient and faithful contextualization. Obedient and faithful contextualization. And, and that is how we must interact with the word of God, with instructions of God, with the commands of God. Obedient and faithful contextualization. So what Jesus has done and what Jesus is showing us is that the word of God is always to be obeyed. We don't twist it. We don't adjust it. We don't think about our personal preferences before we do what he says. We obey it all the way. Faithful because we have to find a way of responsibly leaving out what the word of God demands. But contextualization because there is a difference in context between when the Bible was written and the world in which we live today. Is anyone tracking with me? So for instance, Jesus is able to look at Isaiah's passage and say, what was going on? What was Isaiah talking about? Isaiah in chapter 29 was talking to the religious leaders of his day. There were no Pharisees then. There were no teachers of the law then. And so Isaiah wasn't talking directly to the Pharisees, but at the same time, what Isaiah read, what, um, what Isaiah, hey, God help me, what Isaiah wrote <laughs> applies to the Pharisees as well because the Pharisees were also the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Jesus has contextualized, he has breached the gap between the context of Elijah and his own modern context. Let me break it down a little bit more. So how can we do this? I think there are four questions that we need to consider to be able to do this well. One, when you come to interact with a particular passage of the Bible, or you come to interact with a particular command from the Bible, or you're interacting with a passage and you're reading it and you're trying to get to grips with it, one, ask the question, who said it and when? Who said it and when? Two, who or what were they addressing? Three, what does it mean? And this one, I want to stop everybody and say, when you're having a Bible study, people usually say, and you ask the question, so what does this mean? And then somebody re responds, what it means to me is, eh -eh. if a passage has one meaning for me, and it has another meaning for woman, then it doesn't have a meaning. Meaning is not something that changes with time. Meaning is always dependent on what the writer wants to communicate. What changes, though, is how you apply the meaning. So that leads to the fourth question. The meaning is always constant, but how we carry it out can be different. Who said it and when? Who or what were they addressing? What does it mean and how can I carry it out? Let's break it down again. Let's apply it to one particular passage. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. He says, your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Verse 4, he says, rather it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So you read that and you're trying to get to grips with what's going on here because a lot of people have said a number of things based on this passage. So, First question, who said it? Anybody, who said it? Peter. It wasn't a trick question, I swear. It wasn't. It was Peter who said it. Hence, 1 Peter chapter 3. 
Peter said it, right? Peter said it, and who was he addressing? If you read that particular context well, if you read the um, entire book well, and we've done a series on, on, on First Peter as a church, I think 2020, um, Peter is really talking about believers who are living in exile, believers who are living um, scattered across different parts of the Roman Empire, and he's talking to them about how they are meant to conduct their lives and how they are meant to live their lives. But specifically in chapter 3, he, he's talking here to the women, and then he talks later on to the men. And so that is what he's specifically addressing. But actually, when you read what he's saying, you see that what Peter is addressing is not just relevant for women, it is relevant for men as well. And so who wrote it? Peter. Who is he addressing? He's addressing women, and actually in general, all believers. What does he mean? Question three. Some people can say, put, put up verse three again. You read the passage and you say, ah, your adornment should not come from elaborate hairstyle. Hmm, what is elaborate hairstyle in our day? Bone straight. <laughs> Brazilian hair. It wasn't me. Somebody said it. Somebody said it. Somebody said it. Somebody said it. They're yeah, like, ah, so Christian women should not have bone straight. Christian women should not even wear wigs. Christian women should only do what? Shuku? You know, with thread. You say, oh, and the wearing of gold. No, you can't. Gold? Who is wearing gold here? Who is, where's your gold? Chine, give me your gold. Give me your gold. All of you idolaters, give me your gold. Or the wearing of fine clothes. Ah, no, your clothes are too fine. Ruby, you are too fine. No, give it to me. No. If you read it carefully, you see that what's he talking about? He says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment. But then in verse 4, he says you should be more known for what is on the inside. In other words, Peter is not directly addressing what style of hair you wear, whether you wear gold or you wear certain things. What Peter is trying to get at is that we should be the kind of people, men and women in God's sight, who are more known by what is on the inside than what is on the outside. That when people ask you, what are you wearing, your answer shouldn't be given to you. Your answer should be the fruit of the Spirit. That is what Peter is addressing. Do you see? So how then do we apply it? Question four. How do we apply it? Now, this is going to be different. This is where we then have to recognize it's going to be different for different people. Somebody else can say, I don't really care about bone straight, so I can, I can still keep wearing bone straight. I don't really care that much about this type of dress, so I can still keep wearing it. Somebody else will say, Man, I know that this thing used to really hold me in its grip. I was dysfunctional if I didn't have a certain kind of dress, if I wasn't wearing gold and all of those things. So I'm going to do away with that. Do you see? The meaning is the same, but the application is what? Different. But anytime we bind people's consciences out of personal preference, anytime we bind people's consciences out of something that we like and something that we're trying to avoid, what we end up doing is that we twist God's word. And in twisting God's word, we miss God's word because we have elevated our own word above God's word. And in so doing, we have dethroned God's word. We miss God's person because we are distracted by people and things. We miss God's word because we have elevated our own word and our own desires. But lastly, what else do we miss? If you've been following this passage, and if we are going to be fair with the Pharisees, we, the Pharisees have made some blunders, but there's a question that all these things are leading toward, and I think it's an important question. What is really at the heart of the Pharisees doing all these things is the question, how does God transform people? How does God change people? How do we become a people who are marked by God, set apart from him, and doing his will and his bidding? And we are shining as the holy nation and treasured people that God has called us to. How do we become that? The way of the Pharisees is the way of keeping rules. And so do this, wash, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, keeping rules. But you see, what really happens is not so much that you, are, you, you become more like God, is that you are becoming more like the Pharisees as you keep rules. 
You are becoming like them. And so you can, you can mark yourself and say, oh, how well am I doing against this person? The problem with the Pharisees' rule-keeping wasn't that it was too high a demand. It was that it was too low a demand. Because the standard became the righteousness and holiness of the Pharisees rather than the righteousness and the holiness of God. But even if you are not a Christian this morning, you are not a Pharisee, if you like, can I tell you that even you keep rules? Oftentimes, people who say they don't like people who keep rules, they have one rule. Don't tell me to keep your rule. But what has ended up happening in both cases is that we actually are just picking which set of rules to obey. We are actually discounting God's rules. And what does Jesus say in verse 6? When Jesus is addressing the Pharisees, it is what Jesus says to all those who, keep, who think keeping rules is what transforms us. He says, you hypocrites. Because you never actually follow your own rules. You never actually follow your own standards. You never actually follow to the end what you are asking people to do. So where then does change come from? You see, God told his people to wash and to cleanse themselves. And if they didn't cleanse themselves, it was on the pain of death because he is such a holy and righteous God. None of us can dare to stand in his presence. None of us can dare to approach him. And God knew that the people's washing couldn't save them. And so that washing was meant to point to the washing that only he can. And so he says in Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. In other words, God is saying that the only way that we can be transformed is if he extends his grace to us and does for us what we could never do for ourselves. So the way that we end up being transformed is not by keeping rules. The way we end up being transformed is by embracing his grace. And the people of God were waiting all their lives for that promise from Ezekiel to be fulfilled. And generation after generation after generation kept longing and kept waiting and kept hoping and kept desiring until Jesus appeared on the scene. And John describing Jesus, he says in John 1, 11, that this person who has appeared to us is very God, the Son of God, who was full of grace and truth. And then he says in verse 14, that Moses gave us the law, but grace and truth came through Jesus. In other words, friends, Jesus is not looking, overlooking all the things that we do that don't please him. Jesus is not saying, oh, it doesn't really matter that you have this sin and these impurities. That's the truth. Jesus says you have that. But his grace is that in spite of those things, you can come to me. In spite of those things, I'm going to cleanse you. In spite of those things, I'm going to pour my clean water. I'm going to shed my blood for you so that you can become one who is truly clean. So like we celebrated last weekend, that's the beauty of Easter. And so we are now people who, those of us who have trusted in Jesus, the words of Titus chapter 3 verses 4 to 7 ring so true. And I want us to read it together. It says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared... He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. And then verse 7, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Do you see that? He washed us in the new birth and has extended the grace of his son, Jesus Christ, to us. This is how we live as the people of God. We don't keep rules to earn God's favor we have already been given God's favor in the person of Jesus through his grace so we can do all the things that God has called us to do. 
if we don't embrace God's method, the method of grace, we will miss God. And God is extending his grace to all of us here this morning. And so I want us to bow down and just in contemplative prayer for the next few seconds. Here in the room and online, if you're a Christian, I want you to just marvel again at that grace of Jesus. That you don't have to be one who immerses yourself in a pool to earn the favor of God. You don't have to be one who washes pots and pans before you can be clean. You don't have to be one who washes and washes and scrubs away because that soap will not wash it away. It is only the blood of Jesus. It is only the grace of Jesus extended to you. So thank him for that. Maybe some of us, there are ways in which we are missing God. We are missing the person of God. Or maybe there are ways in which you are missing the word of God and you are twisting by expanding, by adding, by subtracting, by modifying. Ask God for grace this morning to faithfully live in obedience to his word, contextualized, but to his word rightly. Maybe you are not a Christian. Jesus is urging you this morning to come as well. Come. Can we stand to our feet as we pray together?